Chapter 23 Froboz was located in a group of several hundred rarely visited worlds known as the XYZZY Cluster. These planets all dated back to the early days of the Oasis, and each one recreated the environment of some classic text adventure game or MUD multi-user dungeon. Each of these worlds was a kind of shrine, an interactive tribute to the Oasis's earliest ancestors. Text adventure games, often referred to as interactive fiction by modern scholars, used text to create the virtual environment the player inhabited. The game program provided you with a simple written description of your surroundings that asked what you wanted to do next. To move around or interact with your virtual surroundings, you keyed in text commands telling the game what you wanted your avatar to do. These instructions had to be very simple, usually composed of just two or three words, such as go south or get sword. If a command was too complex, the game's simple parsing engine wouldn't be able to understand it. By reading and typing text, you made your way through the virtual world, collecting treasure, fighting monsters, avoiding traps, and solving puzzles until you finally reached the end of the game. The first text adventure game I'd ever played was called Colossal Cave, and initially, the text-only interface had seemed incredibly simple and crude to me. But after playing for a few minutes, I quickly became immersed in the reality created by the words on the screen. Somehow, the game's simple two-sentence room descriptions were able to conjure up vivid images in my mind's eye. Zork was one of the earliest and most famous text adventure games. According to my Grail diary, I'd played the game through to the end just once, all in one day, over four years ago. Since then, in a shocking display of unforgivable ignorance, I'd somehow forgotten two very important details about the game. Number one. Zork began with your character standing outside a shuttered white house. Number two, inside the living room of that white house, there was a trophy case. To complete the game, every treasure you collected had to be returned to the living room and placed inside the trophy case. Finally, the rest of the quatrain made sense. The captain conceals the jade key in a dwelling long neglected, but you can only blow the whistle once the trophies are all collected. Decades ago, Zork and its sequels had all been licensed and recreated inside the Oasis as stunning three-dimensional immersive simulations, all located on the planet Froboz, which was named after a character in the Zork universe. So, the dwelling long neglected, the one I'd been trying to locate for the past six months, had been sitting right out in the open on Froboz this entire time, hiding in plain sight. I checked the ship's navigational computer. Traveling at light speed, it would take me just over 15 minutes to reach Froboz. There was a good chance the Sixers would beat me there. If they did, there would probably already be a small armada of Sixer gunships waiting in orbit around the planet when I dropped out of light speed. I would have to fight my way through them to reach the surface, and then either lose them or try to find the Jade Key with them still breathing down my neck. Not a good scenario. Luckily, I had a backup plan. My ring of teleportation. It was one of the most valuable magic items in my inventory, looted from the horde of a red dragon I'd slain on Gygax. The ring allowed my avatar to teleport once a month to any location in the Oasis. I only used it in dire emergencies, as a last-ditch means of escape, or when I needed to get somewhere in a big hurry, like right now. I quickly programmed the Vonnegut's onboard computer to autopilot the ship to Froboz. I instructed it to activate its cloaking device as soon as it dropped out of hyperspace, then locate me on the planet's surface and land somewhere nearby. If I was lucky, the Sixers wouldn't detect my ship and blast it out of the sky before it could reach me. If they did, I'd be stuck on Froboz with no way to leave while the entire Sixer army closed in on me. I engaged the Vonnegut's autopilot, then activated my ring of teleportation by speaking the command word, Brundle. When the ring began to glow, I said the name of the planet where I wished to teleport. A world map of Froboz appeared on my display. It was a large world, and like the planet Middletown, its surface was covered with hundreds of identical copies of the same simulation. 
in this case, recreations of the Zorg playing field. There were 512 copies of it, to be exact, which meant there were 512 white houses spaced out evenly across the planet's surface. I should be able to obtain the Jade Key at any one of them, so I selected one of the copies at random on the map. My ring emitted a blinding flash of light, and a split second later, my avatar was there, standing on the surface of Frobaz. I opened my Grail diary and located my original notes on how to solve Zork. Then I pulled up a map of the game's playing field and placed it in the corner of my display. Surveying the skies, I didn't see any sign of the Sixers, but that didn't mean they hadn't already arrived. Sorrento and his underlings had probably just teleported to one of the other playing fields. Everybody knew that the Sixers had already been camped out in Sector 7, waiting for this moment. As soon as they saw H's score increase, they would have used Findoro's Tablet of Finding and learned that he was currently on Frobaz, which meant the entire Sixer Armada would already be on its way here. So, I needed to get to the key as quickly as possible, then get the hell out of Dodge. I took a look around. My surroundings were eerily familiar. The opening text description in the game Zork reads as follows. West of House you are standing in an open field west of a white house, with a boarded front door. There is a small mailbox here. My avatar now stood in that open field, just west of the white house. The front door of the old Victorian mansion was boarded up, and there was a mailbox just a few yards away from me, at the end of the walkway leading to the house. The house was surrounded by a dense fog forest, and beyond it, I saw a range of jagged mountain peaks. Glancing off to my left, I spotted a path leading to the north, right where I knew it should be. I ran around to the back of the house. I found a small window there, slightly ajar, and I forced it open and climbed inside. As expected, I found myself in the kitchen. A wooden table sat in the center of the room, and on it rested a large brown sack and a bottle of water. A chimney stood nearby, and a staircase led up to the attic. A hallway off to my left led to the living room, just like in the game, but the kitchen also contained things that weren't mentioned in the game's text description of this room. A stove, a refrigerator, several wooden chairs, a sink, and a few rows of kitchen cabinets. I opened the fridge. It was full of junk food, fossilized pizza, snack puddings, lunch meat, and a wide array of condiment packets. I checked the cupboards. They were filled with canned and dry goods, rice, pasta, soup, and cereal. One entire cupboard was crammed with boxes of vintage breakfast cereals, most of which had been discontinued before I'd been born. Fruit Loops, Honeycombs, Lucky Charms, Count Chocula, Quisp, Frosted Flakes, and hidden way at the back was a lone box of Cap'n Crunch. Printed clearly on the front of it were the words, Free Toy Whistle Inside. The captain conceals the jade key in a dwelling long neglected. I dumped the contents of the box out on the counter, scattering golden cereal nuggets everywhere. Then I spotted it, a small plastic whistle encased in a clear cellophane envelope. I tore off the cellophane and held the whistle in my hand. It was yellow in color with the cartoon face of Cap'n Crunch molded on one side and a small dog on the other. The words, Cap'n Crunch, Bosun Whistle, were embossed on the side. I raised the whistle to my avatar's lips and blew into it, but the whistle emitted no sound and nothing happened. You can only blow the whistle once the trophies are all collected. I pocketed the whistle and opened the sack on the kitchen table. I saw a clove of garlic inside and I added it to my inventory. Then I ran west into the living room. The floor was covered with a large oriental rug. Antique furniture, the kind I'd seen in films from the 1940s, was positioned around the room. A wooden door with odd characters carved into its surface was set into the west wall. And against the opposite wall, there was a beautiful glass trophy case. It was empty. A battery-powered lantern sat on top of the case and a shining sword was mounted on the wall directly above it. I took the sword and the lantern, then rolled up the oriental rug, uncovering the trapdoor I already knew was hidden underneath. 
I opened it, revealing a staircase that led down into a darkened cellar. I turned on the lamp. As I descended the staircase, my sword began to glow. I continued to refer to the Zork notes in my Grail diary, which reminded me exactly how to make my way through the game's labyrinth of rooms, passageways, and puzzles. I collected all nineteen of the game's treasures as I went, returning repeatedly to the living room in the White House to place them in the trophy case a few at a time. Along the way, I had to do battle with several NPCs, a troll, a cyclops, and a really annoying thief. As for the legendary Gru, lurking in the dark, waiting to dine upon my flesh, I simply avoided him. Aside from the cap and crunch whistle hidden in the kitchen, I found no surprises or deviations from the original game. To solve this immersive three-dimensional version of Zork, I simply had to perform the exact same actions required to solve the original text-based game. By running at top speed, and by never stopping to sightsee or second-guess myself, I managed to complete the game in 22 minutes. Shortly after I collected the last of the game's 19 treasures, a tiny brass bubble, a notice flashed in my display, informing me that the Vonnegut had arrived outside. The autopilot had just landed the ship in the field to the west of the White House. Its cloaking device was still engaged and its shields were up. If the Sixers were already here, in orbit around the planet, I was hoping they hadn't spotted my ship. I ran back to the living room of the White House one last time and placed the final treasure inside the trophy case. Just as in the original game, a map appeared inside the case, directing me to a hidden barrow that marked the end of the game. But I wasn't concerned with the map or with finishing the game. All of the trophies were now collected in the case, so I took out the cap and crunch whistle. It had three holes across the top, and I covered the third one to generate the 2600 hertz tone that had made this whistle famous in the annals of hacker history. Then, I blew one clear, shrill note. The whistle transformed into a small key, and my score on the scoreboard increased by 18,000 points. I was back in second place, a mere 1,000 points ahead of H. A second later... The entire Zork simulation reset itself. The 19 items in the trophy case vanished, returning to their original locations, and the rest of the house and the game's playing field returned to the same state in which I'd found them. As I stared at the key in the palm of my hand, I felt a brief jolt of panic. The key was silver, not the milky green color of jade. But when I turned the key over and examined it more closely, I saw that it actually appeared to be wrapped in silver foil, like a stick of gum or a bar of chocolate. I carefully peeled the wrapper away, and a key made of polished green stone was revealed inside, the jade key. And, just like the copper key, I saw that it had a clue etched into its surface. Continue your quest by taking the test. I reread it several times but had no immediate revelations as to its meaning, so I placed the key in my inventory, then examined the wrapper. It was silver foil on one side and white paper on the other. I didn't see any markings on either side. Just then, I heard the muffled roar of approaching spacecraft, and I knew it must be the Sixers. It sounded like they were here in force. I pocketed the wrapper and ran out of the house. Overhead, thousands of Sixer gunships filled the sky, like an angry swarm of metal wasps. The ships were separating into small groups as they descended, heading off in different directions, as if to blanket the entire surface of the planet. I didn't think the Sixers would be foolish enough to try to barricade all 512 instances of the White House. That strategy had worked for them on Ludus, but only for a few hours and they'd only had one location to barricade. The entire planet of Frobaz was in a PvP zone, and both magic and technology functioned here, which meant that all bets were off. There would be hordes of gunters arriving here soon, armed to the teeth, and if the Sixers tried to keep all of them at bay, it would mean war on a scale never before seen in the history of the Oasis. As I continued running across the field and up the ramp of my ship, I spotted a large squadron of gunships, about a hundred or so, descending from the sky directly above my location. 
They appeared to be headed straight for me. Max had already powered up the Vonnegut's engines, so I shouted for him to lift off as soon as I was aboard. When I reached the cockpit controls, I threw the throttle wide open, and the descending swarm of Sixer gunships banked hard to follow me. As my ship blasted its way skyward, I began to take heavy fire from several directions, but I was lucky. My ship was fast, and my shields were top of the line, so they managed to hold up long enough for me to reach orbit. But they failed a few seconds later, and the Vonnegut's hull suffered an alarming amount of damage in the handful of seconds it took me to make the jump to light speed. It was a close call. The bastards almost got me. My ship was in bad shape, so instead of returning directly to my stronghold, I headed to Joe's Garage, an orbital starship repair shop over in Sector 10. Joe's was an honest NPC-operated establishment with reasonable rates and lightning-fast service. I used them whenever the Vonnegut needed repairs or upgrades. While Joe and his boys worked on my ship, I sent H a brief email to say thanks. I told him that whatever debt he felt he owed me was now most definitely paid in full. I also copped to being a colossally insensitive, self-centered asshole and begged him to forgive me. As soon as the repairs to my ship were finished, I headed back to my stronghold. Then I spent the rest of the day glued to the news feeds. The word about Frobaz was out, and every gunter with the means had already teleported there. Thousands of others were arriving by spacecraft every minute to do battle with the Sixers and secure their own copy of the Jade Key. The news feeds were airing live coverage of the hundreds of large-scale battles breaking out on Frobaz around nearly every instance of the dwelling long neglected. The big Gunter clans had once again banded together to launch a coordinated attack on the Sixers' forces. It was the beginning of what would come to be known as the Battle of Frobaz, and casualties were already mounting on both sides. I also kept a close eye on the scoreboard, waiting to see evidence that the Sixers had begun to collect copies of the Jade Key while their forces held the opposition at bay. As I feared, the next score to increase was the one beside Sorrento's IOI employee number. It jumped 17,000 points, moving him into fourth place. Now that the Sixers knew exactly where and how to obtain the Jade Key, I expected to see their other avatar scores begin to jump as Sorrento's underlings followed his lead. But to my surprise, the next avatar to snag the Jade Key was none other than Shoto. He did it less than 20 minutes after Sorrento. Somehow, Shoto had managed to evade the hordes of Sixers currently swarming all over the planet, enter an instance of the White House, collect all 19 of the required treasures, and obtain his copy of the key. I continued to watch the scoreboard, expecting to see his brother Daito's score increase as well. But that never happened. Instead, a few minutes after Shoto obtained his copy of the key, Daito's name disappeared from the scoreboard entirely. There was only one possible explanation. Daito had just been killed.